This episode contains overtly graphic content that may be found disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 3 A Dark Sunrise Somewhere in Mexico, several years before the world went dark. Tensions grew between the two cartel organizations as the cooperation between the FBI and the Federal Ministerial Police galvanized their efforts, seeking the demise of these criminal chapters. Networks of international and local authorities began exacting sophisticated, stealth-like raids and stings deep across southern Mexico. This tidal wave of tyrannical justice that swept the gang-ridden community brought with it severe casualties to the ruthless criminals. The Beltran Leva had already been reduced to a small fraction of members and had sustained massive financial blows to their bottom line. These losses gave the cartel a bleak future one might convey as the darkest of sunrises, as lenders supporting the struggling faction would soon go unpaid. No Beltran Levo would be safe after that, as an unpaid debt must be resolved, one way or another, no matter the borrower. With the walls closing in on them, the Sinaloa increased its pressure on the Beltran Leva, not predicting the death throw its counterpart was about to make. As the doors flew open, his grandfather walked in and looked at the amateur air in front of him with a sense of frustration. Chavez stood up and put a robe on as he turned around and yelled at a nude man and woman on his oversized, tacky gold sofa. The pair of nudists quickly gathered their clothes and a few toys one toy still sounding off with an electrical hum, annoying the heir's grandfather that much more, and hurriedly made their way out of the massive, luxurious suite. Chavez looked at the man who seemed more than three times his age and rolled his eyes. Spanish words began to echo against the cold Spanish tile flooring throughout the expansive interior. What is the meaning of this, old man? Chavez barked. 
The old man looked at the young gangster, who was very tall, darker in tone than most, and held an egotistical resting face. He was clean-shaven, with long black hair and dark brown eyes. Appearing to be in his late twenties, he addressed the older gentleman with respect, but didn't mind showing his anger with him. What could possibly be so important as to disturb me in this fashion, Senor Cruz? The old man, standing no more than five feet tall and wearing thick eyeglasses, began to explain his recent and abrupt interruption. He watched as the naked pair left, shaking his head in shame. You are irresponsible. You will be in charge one day, and you will not be ready when the time comes to make serious decisions. The younger Chavez looked at the old man, obviously having heard this speech before, and slightly rolled his eyes. However, his expression changed as the old man continued to speak. There was a setup. We sent our best man in to handle a contract, but he was quickly arrested instead. Our empire relies on his swift release. What will you do, grandson? Chavez looked at the man, slightly confused. Who is this you speak of? And where is my father? Does he know? And that's when the old man looked at Chavez as though he were an idiot and chuckled through his first few words. Don't you get it, child? Your father was the man we sent in. Your father is the one in jail. Suddenly, Chavez grew a serious expression and clenched his jaw. To continue such a backstory, it may be wise to fill in a detail known to many within this world of chaos, but to few peering in from the outside. For the latter and greater part of the recent century, the cartels were often in conflict with governments on an international scale. This never caused their ranks to diminish in size, instead proving their government counterparts' efforts futile. Their numbers simply grew, and they grew at daunting speeds. Law enforcement had several victories, but altogether continuously failed to reach their ultimate objective, having only just scratched the surface of the extensive cartel network. Populations across the globe where these criminals thrived, left several towns to simply comply as they would ultimately become cartel property. And the local governments remained silent when it came to the matter of these relentless usurpers. The cartels made a very strong effort to avoid direct conflict with law enforcement. However, with a big enough bargaining chip, it would stand to reason that one could convince anybody to come out and play. For instance, Historical records dictated several instances upon which upper management within the cartels, which had been locked up, surprisingly proved to be such a chip. Although, when this occurred in a town run by a cartel, the organizations were known to simply outnumber and swiftly overrun the police and force them to hand over their desired prisoners. As this harkens back to our own historical practices throughout what some would call the era of the Wild West, we can clearly see that repeating history is simply in our nature. Sadly, this meal is not served a la carte. Instead, it arrives hand in hand with its cohort irony. And irony, even for the most powerful, can be very hard to swallow. It is now that the tables have been turned. We finally see the paradox we find ourselves in, begging the question, which came first? Order or chaos? Still though, the world keeps turning. Chavez's father was fortunately being held in one of these small cartel-run communities. The problem was, however, that he was in a town that was currently run by the Beltran Leva, the Sinaloa's rival cartel faction. Chavez, now in a suit and tie, while sporting a slick pair of dark wraparounds, approached a helicopter landing on his patio, using one hand to shield his eyes from the late morning sun. As he did so, two men jumped out and quickly approached their acting CEO. As a dialogue broke out over the sounds of blades nearby, the brief meeting had concluded that breaking his father out would be better, sooner, rather than later. 
Otherwise, he was sure to be extracted to a more secure location by the authorities that caught up with him, possibly sometime early the next morning. Their window of opportunity was exceedingly short, and it was growing shorter by the minute. They also knew that their rivals could not protest the territory infringement, seeing that they would be conducting said rescue mission upon their grounds, as their numbers were far too lean to be anything but on the defense. And as for the local law enforcement? Well, the Sinaloa had overrun far more with far less, and were not phased by the task in the slightest. The plan would move forward. They would descend on this small town, this town called Punto Alegre, just beyond the state of Sinaloa, nearly half a day's trip from their current location. Being nearly noon already, the Sinaloa cartel began mobilizing, exhausting nearly all its heavy machinery, weaponry, and soldiers in preparation for the hours long advance on their mission that lay ahead. As they did so, upon a closer look, it would become obvious to one that they were also preparing for a conflict to occur under the blanket of a dark night sky. And to describe such a task, soon to be played out, one may take some time as they might pause for a brief reflection. Because there is something so odd about the juxtaposition one finds themselves in, an infinite frozen void within the distant stars, light years apart from one another. This illustrating the intense loneliness its architects must have felt upon rendering such a depressing environment without life, energy, or even a single spark of warmth. But the deep freeze of space doesn't simply stop here. Mother Nature, as they call her, has always been one with an imagination, and perfectionism seems key to her persistent destructive patterns. This display seems to go on effortlessly and seemingly endlessly, exposing the universe as a place where control is just a strange rumor, twisting and turning within the furthest flung recesses. Chaos, meanwhile, clinging firmly to the norm. Yet, for a brief moment, a microscopical infection, perhaps a rogue offspring of a genetic mutation, hurdles throughout the chaos. Oblivious of the minefield, it speedily traverses. One looks closer upon this blue crystal, tumbling toward its foreseeable and dramatic end. Temporarily escaping the chaos along the way, it keeps cheating death only unwittingly narrowing its odds while doing so. Here we find mankind, an intelligent species so hungry for order, it has simply overlooked that in this universe, the victor will always be chaos. And all else that stands in its path, just as we view in our distant heavens above, will be eliminated without discrimination and with extreme prejudice for evolution itself. Of course, having said all this, nothing else lay in comparison regarding the contrast of chaos and control as our own distant heavens. Nevertheless, we find ourselves in a small town within the state of Chihuahua, Mexico. And here, a community begins to engage in this perplexing thought experiment as chaos rears its familiar and ugly head. Punta Alegre was a somewhat peaceful community that was, for the most part, low to middle class. It boasted of a community college and several amenities, including sizable parks and community centers. It also had a police station, which, with the recent news of a crime boss having been arrested, signaled a suspicious emptiness as only a few people were around, none of which being in uniform. Under the shade of darkness, the Sinaloa pressed on through the town's meager main street, nervously noting the lack of resistance and the eerie absence of law enforcement altogether. Chavez, now sitting in the back of a black armored truck, a truck that was the size of a large delivery vehicle, was surrounded by three men each being high-ranked members of this notorious crime syndicate. Two of the high-ranking officers were his uncles, 
and the other a loyal business partner of his father's. The three of them stood over the computer screens, sitting in the shelving unit on the side of the vehicle's back interior. Another man sat just in front of the gangsters, who wore military fatigues, navigating the exterior cameras just outside. As the four men watched the screens, the cameras depicted the very disturbing surroundings as they drove nearly the entire distance of the town before reaching the police station without confronting one single law enforcement officer. Having witnessed this and it being much too late to turn around, they eventually reached their objective. But as they did so, a relentless shadowy thought persisted within each of their minds. Was this a trap? Now, directly outside of their mobile command center sat a small compound of police equipment and a decent-sized cinder block structure surrounded by a large fence. The fence had barbed wire at the top and cameras posted in various locations. The fence, however, was wide open, leaving the entire entrance exposed to anyone wishing to simply just walk right in. And this secured property, a symbol of the community's command on law and order, was completely and utterly void of any resistance. In front of this building, used as the offices for the local law enforcement personnel, as well as jailing the criminals they would acquire, sat a small parking lot scattered with a few police cruisers. It was here that the cartel came to what seemed to be a synchronized display of vehicles crisscrossing this way and that. Soldiers jumped from trucks, one after another, soon having the entire facility locked down. All the soldiers created a barricade with a line of men on their knees. It was a tactic used worldwide by governments across the globe when conducting raids such as this and seeing the cartels now mimic their own government's techniques in handling their adversaries. It becomes clear to anyone standing by that they are the ones now at the top of this food chain. And to compound this adopted technique with a very high interest rate, just behind these soldiers kneeling, while creating an armed human barricade, another line of men now stood behind them, all wearing riot gear while pointing their rifles at the building. And then a man came out from within the barricade as they parted to make a path for him and held a megaphone to his mouth as he spoke in Spanish expecting to soon gain the attention of any officers inside. If you want to live, I suggest you stop with the games. He said this and looked at his uncles next to him. Both did not change their facial expressions as they slowly looked over to Chavez and then back to the facility, maintaining their typical serious faces. If one were to find themselves somehow engaged in the reading of a brief summary, depicting the two notorious gangsters' backgrounds, now standing next to Chavez, one would then need to secure a strong sense of morbid curiosity and a steel gut to match as to withstand its findings. But no worry, as surely people with such inquisitive and dark minds could not really exist. Still, if one were so inclined, a word of caution would be given. Do not let these words materialize into images across your vulnerable and fragile human mind. The two worked hand in hand as their legacies pressed boundaries few had dared to cross before. Neither had names as they were simply never given any. They were simply dubbed Los Hermanos, the brothers. Their father was a bit eccentric and believed that these two were a blessing from the heavens sent to guard the cartel franchise. And when his eldest son Francisco takes the throne, these two will be there to watch over him. Their dossiers were one and the same, as they were an inseparable force. The last entry in their file would be particularly disturbing. Apparently, a new vendor contracted by the Sinaloa went missing along with millions of dollars of cartel money. The brothers were tasked with securing the organization's assets and punishing all offenders involved. The vendor was a new contractor 
originally recruited from a Tulsa Police Department. Having been a police officer most his life now, Police Captain Jonathan King knew he could change his entire family's identity and relocate themselves without a hitch. And now, with millions of dollars in his most recent transaction between his new client and his own private security firm, the dirty money was too tempting to pass up for the captain. Having his wife on board with the matter and with their two small daughters in tow, the Kings moved to Puerto Rico and quickly became ghosts on their new sprawling ranch in an effort to be forgotten. Now, having grifted the cartel and having changed their identities, their family was set for life. At least, that was the plan. In this world, however, a word of wise to anyone daring to grift one's kingdom. If you're going to do so, aim for the king. And if you aim for the king, you better not miss. But as this next scene unfolds, missing this shot will prove not the error. Instead, it would be the complete lack of any aim in the first place that would spell out their next fates. Police officers breached the scene just moments after the brothers had completed their job. A large, dimly lit kitchen sat silent as law enforcement officers seized the King's family residence, now under the alias of the Shepherds. After receiving a very disturbing emergency call, they were taking all precautions. As they walked through the lowered living room floor toward the kitchen, two small children could be seen lying on the floor in unnatural positions, each with a bullet wound in their skulls. The lead officer signaled the team forward towards the kitchen as she loudly announced their presence in Spanish. Dorado Police, if anyone is in here, announce yourselves now. They moved on as they began to take in the depraved and unholy crime scene. A woman facing away from them sat at a large dining table. A body lay on the table just in front of her. She held a phone to her ear, apparently still on the line with the dispatcher. However, hearing the officers approaching her from behind, she simply let the phone slip from her bloodied face and palm as she trembled. Staring helplessly at her husband's naked, deceased, and dismembered carcass before her, blood seemed to be everywhere. His penis had been crudely removed as a mess of tangled flesh, blood, and entrails lay in its place. Matching the bloody mess on her face and hands was the dinner plate below her, along with the additional remnants of the man's almost fully eaten member, covered in what seemed to be vomit. In her other hand, she held a fork with bloody flesh on its end. And as if this were not the most alarming detail the police took in, as they assessed the scene around them, strapped to her chest was a sophisticated bomb with a small digital clock. And that clock was rapidly closing in on zero. Miss Shepard just sat there as she continued to tremble. The brothers stood in silence while Chavez warned any occupants of the facility one last time. This is your last chance. Hand over, Senor Cruz. Chavez looked at his uncles for direction. They both looked over him slowly and gave him a single nod. Chavez, knowing what this approval had meant, threw his fist in the air, signaling direction to the army of soldiers behind him. And just then, cued by this signal, the facility quickly became bombarded with thousands of metal rounds as the loud sounds of rifles filled the air. Finally, Chavez withdrew his fist, cueing a ceasefire. The compound was still quiet, not a single show of resistance in sight. He looked to his uncles, who scowled and shook their heads, now seeming to disapprove. Chavez, feeling the unnerving silence surrounding him and his entire cartel army, agreed with their estimation. It was all still too suspicious. Chavez threw up three fingers, and with that, immediately, 
three men from random areas of the barricade dutifully responded as they ran past their boss and into the now dilapidated building in front of them. Within a minute or so, they each came out, one by one, and threw a fist in the air, signaling that the building was secured. Several soldiers, around half a dozen or so, entered the building as Chavez and his three top men followed closely behind. Once inside, they could see that the silence outside was not alone, as within the building, nothing resembling any threat or resistance seemed to be around. Still, though, they could not dismiss this as being some kind of trap. They had to move cautiously. But also, and frankly, more importantly, while practicing said caution, in order to emancipate their boss, they knew they must also move quickly. As they came to the back of the building, they carefully peered through the window of a door. Jail cells. They now peered down a cement hallway, separating two sizable rows of jail cells. This had to be where their boss had been taken. Their intel was foolproof. And that intel led them to this station. And now, within the station itself, they located the cells meant for prisoners such as Francisco Cruz, the Sinaloa kingpin. They opened the door and walked through, still wary of the lack of resistance they had so far encountered. They were beginning to think that, just maybe, Perhaps the authorities were tipped off and possibly bailed when they heard that the brothers were involved in the operation. As they walked down the row of empty cells, Chavez paid close attention to the details of his surroundings. Suddenly, ahead of him, his soldiers began yelling in Spanish and aiming all their weapons at a cell directly ahead. The cartel officials ran to catch up and Chavez let an angry expression wash over his face as an unwelcome scene came into view. Kneeling in the center of the cell was his father, Francisco, and behind him, aiming a gun directly at the cartel leader's head, was a young Lazar, later to become known as the Chancellor, the leader of the Beltran Leva, and his father's lifelong rival. Lazar began to mildly laugh, Knowing that he had lost his empire and having nothing left to lose, he closed his eyes and squeezed the trigger. Chavez watched as his dad fell face first onto the cold cement floor, Lazar only laughing louder and louder. Chavez looked to his men. He looked at the brothers. He then looked at the other man, this quiet and loyal business partner of his father's, Marquez. He ordered. He then looked at a button on the side of the cell, directing Marquez to do the same. Marquez, who was not kin to the Cruz family, leaned forward and pressed a red button outside the cell door. A pane of bulletproof glass slid down and sealed Lazar in as gas filled the air within the cell itself. Knowing what was coming, as he looked around, Lazar simply took a knee, gently laid the gun on the ground surprisingly not turning it on himself, and threw the younger Cruz a simple yet expressive wink. And with that, it wasn't long until he joined his counterpart on the cell floor as he was quickly subdued by the gas and forced into a temporary slumber. Marquez now reached into his coat pocket and pulled out a cell phone. He hit a button as the speed dial quickly complied, and within seconds, a man's voice from over the phone could be heard. Marquez spoke to the man on the other side of the call. Mr. Shields, I have what you've requested. The voice on the other end replied. It was the voice of Thomas Shields. I'm glad to see you have changed your mind, Marquez. Perhaps if you would have complied in the first place, I wouldn't have had to arrange this little meeting. And Francisco would still be alive today. Thomas said. He knew, by informing the Beltran Leva of the deal happening within the Sinaloa on Beltran Leva territory, it would prove to be too tempting of a prize for Lazar to simply pass up on. So, with this intel unwittingly acquired from a corrupt American agent, Lazar began to coordinate efforts with local law enforcement 
an agency which he practically owned, to have Francisco detained. Thomas knew that this would bring the Sinaloa face to face with Lazar, the man Thomas needed. Agent Shields then continued to speak over the phone to Marquez. My people will be by in the morning to secure your payment and retrieve our parcel. After that, I will advise my teams to stand down regarding all of your operations south of the U.S. Marquez listened to the words spoken on the other side of the phone conversation while watching Lazar twitch in his induced coma as Shields then hung up. Chavez focused on Lazar with a hatred and rage he had never felt before. Unfortunately, the man now laying before him was worth more alive than dead, and the Sinaloa had to play it smart. He knew Marquez's connections with Agent Shields had demonstrated something odd. It was clear that Thomas was skirting the boundaries of corruption, and it was clear that it was for a powerful client. A client that he would like to see his own outfit someday secure. But for now, especially after seeing the agent just on the other end of Marquez's phone conversation, demonstrate his abilities to manipulate the rivaling cartel factions. Bringing in a bargaining chip without even getting his feet wet. Chavez knew that aside from playing it smart, with the tide slowly turning against them on a global scale, he had to also play it safe. But Chavez knew, as he peered down at Lazar, this man who had just killed his father, that one day he would have his revenge. Lazar's eyes remained shut. But, strangely enough, his entire face began to contort and act in a fashion as if to rapidly age. Then, the Chancellor opened his eyes to the sounds of men off in the distance. His tent was dark as the cover of night engulfed the South Americas. For a moment, he listened to the indiscernible conversation just outside. Having been awake for several days, fleeing the enemy's advance on Esmeralda, he had just now finally received some rest. The Chancellor rubbed his eyes as he sat up, eventually rising to his feet, still completely dressed in fatigues. He stepped outside and took in the view under the moonlight. His entire garrison, after moving non-stop for several days now, found itself situated on a hilltop that overlooked a large community of residents, mostly starving or dying from the lack of clean water. It was the town of Tunja. The Chancellor stopped near his brother Nicholas, now his only brother left, who was studying the community with a pair of binoculars, using what little light the moon was providing. We take over the town in the morning, the Chancellor said, as he gained the attention of his little brother. They will never find us here, he continued, referring to the American faction who had leveled his last fortress to rubble. We still have nine days before our first shipment is due. This town has plenty of assets, but we'll have to speed up the process. And this time, anyone found skirting our fucking borders, I don't just want blood. I want their fucking heads on fucking spikes. With that, noticing his brother's annoyance, Nicholas withdrew the binoculars from his face and maintained an equally frustrated persona. And then, as quickly as he'd arrived, the Chancellor hastily returned to his tent. 